Hello, I'm Paddy Delaney, and welcome to Integrated Infrastructure, a podcast dedicated to bringing you news and views from industry leaders involved in the development, design, construction, and management of the many built forms that make up Australia's integrated infrastructure. This is Integrated Infrastructure, episode 25, and in this episode, we welcome Dr. Natalie Galea, Australia's leading researcher in human rights in the construction industry. Natalie is one of the key players in Australia, driving research, influencing, and transforming workers' rights in the construction industry. In this podcast, we cover Natalie's three careers, starting out as an Olympian athlete before taking that competitive edge into the construction industry, and then deciding to leave the industry to study why women leave the construction industry at such a high rate and and earlier than their male counterparts. We discussed Natalie's research to date, how it first focused on women in the construction industry, and now how it's moved on and developed into research around all workers' human rights, and the knock-on that the industry has onto families and home life. We talk about the work she's doing with Roberts Co and Concord Hospital, and finally about her initiative to help young women progress in the industry through her sponsorship programme. Natalie shares a wealth of ideas, facts and figures with us and is equally engaging and entertaining. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Please like, share, comment and subscribe if you do. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Natalie. Natalie, welcome to the Integrated Infrastructure Podcast. Fantastic to have you on. Um, um, As always, let's kick off by you introducing yourself and um, telling people um, who you are and what you do. Yeah, hello. My name's Dr. Natalie Galea. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Australian Human Rights Institute, uh, which is in the law faculty at the University of Sydney. Um, and I'm also the co-founder and director of Cultivate Sponsorship. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, look, we're going to talk about your um, um, your interest in construction and the work that you've been doing there. But um, t- tell us a bit about your careers first, your pl- careers in plural, um, yeah, and, and I- your background. Yeah, I often say that I've had um, three careers. My first was as an Olympic athlete. My second was as a construction uh, professional, project manager. Mm -hmm. And my third is now as a researcher and academic. um, And I study human rights in the construction sector and human rights in elite sports. So I've kind of tied my early careers. Yeah, I competed at the 96 Olympic Games in the sport of judo. um, And I narrowed Was Was that Atlanta? Yes, Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and judo, for those who don't know, is um, not – I don't have the long limbs to kick and punch. It's very much close contact and the aim is to throw your opponent as hard and as fast on their back or to strangle them until they submit or arm lock them until you either break their arm or they submit or hold them down. So it's it's called the gentle way in Japanese. <laughs> um, but if you watch it on, um, you know, YouTube or television, you'll see that it's not that gentle at all. Um, but I played judo for a long time and I originally wanted and probably what sparked, I guess, the desire for gender equality was I actually wanted to play rugby league because I came from a mad roosters uh, family. And, <laughs> Go to um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I couldn't do that, you know, all those years ago and I watched my brothers all play and I was sort of relegated to netball where contact was mm-hmm. limited um, and yeah, when I was 11, I, I was watching the Olympics and I thought that's what I want to do. And, um, at the time I was watching the heptathlon and obviously again, with my short limbs, there was no way I was going to play that sport. So I went and found another sport and it's, um, you know, it's been an incredible experience, um, playing judo and also playing it at an international and Olympic level. Yeah. Amazing. Do you still, do you still um, play judo now? I don't. My body's too broken. Um, yeah. Yeah. Too many knee reconstructions, and so now I just, you know, try to keep my body functional and moving. And yeah. um, I'm not. I'm actually a really lazy person when it comes to exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need the competition? Is that what it is? You need that that angle. I think I need to have that end game. You know, like that end goal. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I go to the gym and walk every day. So I'm physically active, but I do yeah. it purely for mobility. And yeah, um, yeah, there's no, I, I'm not even that competition in the competitive in the gym. I just, you know, honestly, I mowed my way through a session. So yeah, <laughs> well I, I can't believe I actually competed at the Olympics, quite frankly, with my approach to sport. 
Well, there must be there must be something. Um, I mean, you work incredibly hard, I know, and you're doing so much work. And I I, I know I used to work with a, a guy in England who was in Team GB. He actually got injured before. I can't remember which Olympics it was that he was going for. Um, anyway, he got injured just before. Terribly sad because the amount of work that goes into that, the discipline and the um, the getting up super early in the morning to get somewhere to practice, and then you know, yeah, it's 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 a lot of dedication. And and that, so what um, what brought you into construction? Yeah, so after Atlanta, um, I had done an arts degree in politics and Indonesian language and um, Asian studies, but I was walking, working in public relations. And if anyone knows me, I'm quite direct, so I'm not exactly the warm and fuzzy PR person. And um, I was sort of looking at my financial situation and, you know, people don't realise this, but athletes just in the Olympic movement, despite being the event that we go and see um, and the product, uh, and also the employee aren't paid. I mean, at the time I was getting $90 a month funding yeah. um, to be an Olympic athlete. So I decided, okay, I'm 25. I need to actually think seriously about my career. And I come from not only Roosters supporters, but subcontracting family of plumbers. Um, my mum and dad had a um, successful subcontracting business. Um, and so I decided, well, you know, I've lived with tradespeople, you know, tradesmen specifically loading the trucks up every morning and unloading them every afternoon and seeing them in the kitchen morning and night. Um, so construction was around me I never decided I never thought it would be a career but at 25 I sort of went okay this is something that I can make um, mm. good money out of and um, earn a great income because comparatively to other sectors because it's so male dominated you do earn good income from it yeah. and I chose that so I went off and studied and started working straight away and um, did a construction management degree and proceeded to work in the sector for another 15 years and I worked yeah. Or um, big contractors, many of them are deceased now, um, Concretes, Walters. Um, I also worked for CSR in, you know, the concrete placement. For Leighton was probably my longest employer overseas mm. in the Middle East and Len Lease in Stockland here in Australia. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So you worked, you, you did both civils and build? Yeah, I was more, I did do civils, but it was more in sort of the pre-contract phase of, you know, yeah. bidding for roads, say, in um, Oman and... Um, yeah. But most of my work was in building. Like I, I was um, project manager on the defence base in Dubai for um, the ADF for yep. Leighton and also worked on um, a big equestrian uh, centre, which is, you know, probably not one that Leighton celebrates terribly much, our Shakab. That was a bloody hard job. Um, <laughs> so, I think yeah. I've heard about that. I think I've you know, heard about that before, yeah. Yeah, it was a really, really, really tough job. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've worked in a number of um, building projects specifically and obviously came out of um, property development with Stockland. Mm. And went from the beautiful white shoe brigade over to the really tough side of contracting. And, yeah. Um, probably should have stayed in development. <laughs> and, and um, you know, you, you, you described, um, you know, you, 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 you say it because you... you we're in construction, working incredibly hard, but decided to to, to leave. What what were your sort of motivators to leave, and um, you know how did all that come about? Yeah, I I was in the Middle East working for Leighton over there, and um, I kind of was observing that you know I was always the only woman in the room, particularly in the operational roles. I was struggling to really progress my career, and even when I was appointed, often you know they'd helicopter in a often more junior man ahead of me, um, mm. and I was just growing frustrated. And I, and I often use the analogy that unlike sport where the rules of the game are crystal clear and you know exactly how to make your way to that medal podium, I, I never could understand that despite the fact that I was working really hard. Like I, mm. I prioritised my career over, you know, having a family and all that type of thing. I, I couldn't understand why it was that I wasn't progressing and mm. um, and for a high achiever, you know, it's it's really hard and I actually, having looked at the research, the women in the sector are generally, you know, they're, they're ambitious people um, yeah. and so and it's actually also the reason why a lot of young women choose not to go into the sector if you look at Dr Philippa Kanamala's research because they can see that it's really hard to progress in a sector because they look at who's in positions of power and they don't see too many women. 
Mm. So I I was at a stage there where I was sort of about 38 and decided well, this isn't working for me, so I'm going to go off and study why it is that women leave the construction sector. <laughs> um, and I um, did a PhD in this area and more broadly I was part of a research study that looked at why it was, despite all these gender equality policies being in place by construction companies, that women's participation, recruitment and um, progression was actually tracking backwards, if not staying the same, over decades. Yeah. So, you know, why were these policies failing to attract, retain and progress women? And that study, you know, really sent us out onto sites and um, we, we really wanted to see how the policies that are often formed at head office, how they travel um, or do they travel to construct mm. sites. And then my PhD was a bit more controversial. It looked at what maintains men's um, overrepresentation and powerfulness in the sector. So what are those factors that are at play mm. that, you know, makes it so difficult to make this shift in the construction sector. Mm. Yeah. And, what, and what did you find? Well, if I go to my PhD to start with, I would say that I found that there was a culture of denial and indifference around the problem that, you know, a lot of senior leaders um, really lacked, I guess, understanding, awareness and ownership of the issue um, mm. and that they would say, oh, women don't want to work in our sector, so it's basically a problem that exists out there. Um, they didn't realise that the way we do work um, in construction, you know, has a, has a gendered effect. And one of that is that, you know, it, it makes it very hard for um, women both to be recruited and retained and progress. But, you know, as I've later, um, well, I found out through the research that it also has, um, I guess, an unintended consequence on the, on the male workforce around their wellbeing and, and um, their health in terms of, um, you know, what, it, that's the other effect. So it's two sides of a coin, I often say. You know, you have that mm. gender, gendered effect in terms of what it does to women in terms of the participation, but then it has um, an effect on the majority of the workforce who are men, and that is, you know, the, the high suicides rates in the sector, mm. like high marriage breakdowns, um, substance abuse, et cetera. So mm. that was one of the first things. The other thing that I found was that, you know, again, that these the way we set up jobs and we deliver work, um, it also has gender consequences. So there's this perception that the way we deliver work and the rules in which we engage has no um, gendered consequences, and it does, mm. that it does have it for men and women. And the third finding was that moves towards gender equality were often met with resistance and backlash. Um, for instance, you know, by the time it got to site, that, you know, the, the site pressures was, oh, we can't possibly give people, you know, flexible work or we can't possibly design or deliver a project in a different manner yeah. against what we've always done, you know, it just wouldn't work. Or, um, you know, the very fact that most of these sites that we went to, we travelled to six sites, we shadowed construction workers and what we found is that despite having all different types of construction contracts, normatively they all behaved like they were working on a fixed lump sum with massive uh, liquidated damages as sanctions should they run over time. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that we found in our study, you know, aside from my PhD, was um, that, you know, at each stage of women's careers, you know, there are, there are really strong barriers to mm. um, their recruitment uh, their participation and their progression. Um, the codification of policies and procedures, particularly around recruitment and promotion, is, is quite limited, despite these companies having, I guess, you know, probably leading the pack in terms of their approach. Um, there was a over, an over-focus on the recruitment of graduates, which was great and um, really codified and, and thorough and had rigour. But beyond graduate recruitment, it really mm. relied on informal formal rules and informal, I guess, relationships and networks in terms of recruitment, both into the company beyond graduate recruitment, but also onto construction projects. Mm. And we found that, you know, senior leaders who predominantly were men, you know, had this great, um, had a lot of discretion over who they appointed and who they picked for their team. And they often took their people from um, project to project with them, but also from company to company. Um, and then there was also, you know, basic sexism that, um, you know, women's confidence and capabilities were constantly being debated and questioned. And yet, you know, the, their male equivalents were, you know, just seen as 
you know, well, the norm. You know, they were never, yeah. they were barely raised a discussion. Um, parental leave was another major issue that, um, you know, one company reported that they lost 50% of their um, employees who went on parental leave. Yeah. And yet that was because I think largely that parental leave was really not um, led by either HR or the operations team. And in construction, um, operational leaders often have a lot of power over um, construction workers' careers and mm. shaping their careers. But in the case of parental leave, we found that women were left to um you know, really um, map out themselves, their their departure, their return and their career survival. And if women were um, off a project when they went on to parental leave, if, say, the project ended and they had to return to site, they were often, you know, they fell between the gaps. Yeah. Um, and that was the same for men as well who were primary carers, although in construction, you know, there's very few of those. And I would say that the other thing about men being primary carers that is that the, the research from work, Workplace Gender Equality Agency shows that there's higher discrimination against um, against those men, um, and and there's a real resistance to them taking flexible um, approaching or asking for flexible roles to look after children, um, and it's 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 a higher threshold that they have to meet. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, there was lots, you know, the research. Just un un unpacking yeah. a few of those things, yeah. one, one, one of the things that interests me, you talked about what the way the project was set up and the contract. I mean, that sort of speaks to the, and, and, and it's really interesting what you said there about despite it, it, despite the different forms of contracts and the way that that, that it was people were you know, required to perform, mm -hmm. uh, that it was still a very adversarial environment and mm -hmm. and, 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 and this, despite not necessarily having to be so. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have different contracts and the projects, we went on to six sites around the country, myself mm. and a male researcher. And, um, you know, I was fascinated that the normative response by, um, I guess, the project leaders was that they all behaved as if, you know, you know, there's this push to the end and there's this huge sanctions at the end when actually it might have been a managing contract or they might not have had those big um, penalties, you know, around time. But mm. I think the thing is that, um, it's one of the drivers in this in the sector and it's this you know um, it's why it's a it's a you know masculine culture is that you know it prioritizes this this work and this presenteeism and total availability and and workers are valued according to that so if you're you have you know um, to pick up your children from school or you have care responsibilities for your ageing parents, there's really little accommodation for that. And what was fascinating actually in the research is that we found that um, there was some flexibility, but for men they often did, took it informally, short term, you know, they were having a marriage breakdown and um, they needed to pick their child up and take mm. them to childcare. Um, and so the, you know, the project leaders would let them do it for a short term um, basis and sort of help you know pat out around them so yeah. okay where for women it was much more um formal and there was a penalty associated with that yeah with it's, inter it's interesting because i think that, that um, I, I come across men you know sing single single fathers or, or or with um you know who are divorced and where they where they um feel that they actually don't have a choice other than to go contract um yeah. so they can't actually maintain a permanent position and be a, a good carer um, or no. a, good, a good a good parent, but then and, and then those people are then stigmatised because they haven't been in a permanent role. If then that 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 period of care or their circumstances change or the child goes to school or whatever, and and then um, and then they're absolutely you know as you said they're penalised, they're discounted on a, on a, whether they're male or female on account of not having continuous employment or, or, or experience. Yeah. You know? yeah, and I think I, you know I think men are penalised more because there's a real straitjacket of. Um, masculinity in our second sector mm. and society at large and you know we expect men to be the breadwinner still but I also think what's interesting for companies is that the young men told us that working we we worked with two large construct construction companies um tier ones and their employees men told us that when they had families, they were going to move client side because they yeah. could see you know the, the very essence of um, you know, what was happening ahead of them. And the young women, what was fascinating is that they did dual degrees. So they did a double degree and they saw that, you know, this was an insurance policy for um, 
a sector that wasn't going to move forward. So if they oh. if, if they couldn't manage um, having a child and having a job, they would move to the other sector that they had studied. Yeah, well, that's so interesting because um, we get we're, we're, it just completely tallies with what we find in, in, as, as recruiters. So um, men and women who get to a point in their career where they can't do the six days a week or the even the five days, but the days are so long that they don't actually have much of a life. Um, client side is the answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, those those graduates, whether they're male or female, who are doing the double degrees, super smart. Mm. I, I would highly encourage it. If you're going to do a construction or an engineering do, degree, do a double degree because then you can step over the fence into into client side, into project finance, into other areas. So I, I'd highly recommend it. Yeah. But we work with um, we, we 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 sort of you know we styled our business to be a bit different. We work across the sort of um, the different areas of construction and, um, um, and and we work with people that we really like. So we work with we've got some investment banking clients, we've got some um, infrastructure developer clients, we've got um, you know big 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 four consultants and and and, and um, you know uh, others that compete in that space, and and then design engineering engineering organisations. All of those organisations would ask us um, to, um, um, through a search process and through through providing them with sort of strategic information about why where we've done what why we've done it and you know, what we've found, um, all of them would uh, at some point be interested in what the gender gender split would be, so that when it comes because they know that pulling people from construction industry is really hard to get a good gender split mm -hmm. so they need to be able to demonstrate exactly what the market looks like so then we can say okay well look, we're actually we, we've done we've got um, the shortlist that's more than representative of the marketplace or, or, or you know and we've taken this many people through um i never get asked that by contractors ever no no not once no, no, no. And I think that's really important because, you know, there. this goes to the point of a culture of denial and indifference, you know, mm. that, you know, it's too hard, it's happening, the problem's out there, young girls don't want to go into our, um, don't want to do construction, but actually when you really break down the way recruitment takes place and um, even recruitment into a business or beyond, you know, when you actually really look at that, um, more can be done. And even the transition of skills from outside the construction sector to inside the construction sector is critically important. And why is it that, you know, where are, where is the call to go back and ask those women who have left? And I know that they're a small proportion, you know, to come back and to make amends. And I think a lot of that is because there is, you know, just like the, the contracts and the norms around how we build a job, careers are also shaped around these really rigid norms. So, you know, you, you can't work part-time or in share roles on a construction site, which for me is crazy given that when I worked in construction in the Middle East, I, you know, I ran a 24-hour job. Um, yeah. So we had, you know, people doing share roles. If I was setting up a job in the middle of Saudi Arabia, you know, to build a mining plant, you know, I had to do fly in, fly out. You, you have to have share roles. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a project manager on, uh, a um, safety manager on um, my job in Dubai who was working part-time. She did pick up every day. And quite frankly, over there, safety managers, you know, a really important role because if somebody dies on site, people go to jail. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the management go to jail. So, you know, and, and that worked fine and it worked well. And so I, I think that there's this real rigidness in how we think. And I think that companies need to really, you know, desperately unpick the way they do work before they say there's no women and we can't, yeah. you know, given it, we can't find a gender, an equal gender split. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's the old adage is where there's a will, there's a way, um, and there always is. But you've got to have the will, right? Um, yeah. I mean, but I, I think I think that's something. Um, um, so before we move on, the sort of um, um, across, across the construction industry in different areas, because um, I think that there's a there's talk about um, equality, talk about partnering, talk about um, relationships, and how how um, all these things are driven. And you and, and you know this information it goes goes into tenders, it goes into bids, it goes into responses, and all of these things happen. But the the, the actual follow through then in the action, so the the words that don't meet the actions. And I think I don't think it's just in. Um, the way that they, um, um, you know, look at, at gender and equality and that sort of stuff. I actually think it's through the way that they perform across across projects, and and that probably speaks to the point that you were making about it doesn't matter what contract they've got, they're all still behaving in the same way anyway. Absolutely, and it's really important. I coined the term 
put gender on the tender. And I yeah. think that this is where it's critically important for government clients and private clients. They have a responsibility here. They can really shift um, what contractors perceive as important. Um, and I heard that in my research. If, if the client asks, the contractor usually responds. So mm-hmm. it really is up to government and clients to really set an expectation around gender equality. And quite frankly, at the moment, they aren't. They really aren't doing that. I mean, <laughs> if I look at the New South Wales um, infrastructure, um, you know, I think what's called the 10-point plan, you know, yeah. they're asking to double the number of tradeswomen. Wow, from 1% to 2%, huge. Like, you know, so there's some real serious, there can be some serious action by the people who hold the purse strings within this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to get the contractors off the hook, but the way we deliver work and the expectations around um, how we deliver work are set up early when, you know, clients um, set their tender requirements and it has an impact on what contractors can do when they're actually, you know, on site. That's mm-hmm. not to get the contractors off the hook. Contractors can push back and say, have you thought about innovating in this way and that way and using gender equality as a, you know, a commercial um, leverage point, yeah. for a competitive advantage. And I think we're seeing that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, 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 it is, a, I guess, a life cycle, a whole of life cycle that responds to gender equality. You can't just expect the project director on a site to all of a sudden wave a wand and, you know, magically have 50% women on his site. It, it, yeah. You know, all the different factors have to be considered. Yeah, absolutely. And play the part. Not, 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 not wanting to bash contractors. We love yeah. contractors. We work with them all the time. But they, these, these are serious issues. And, and, and also, it's, it's, it's also very fair to say that a, a lot of, um, of the, of the, the top, top contracting organisations are really trying to do something about this. And I, I know that you're doing um, some work with the, the ACA, and it'd be good to hear about that. But, um, but, but, but the um, look, I, I got introduced to you by Alison Myrams, who was on the podcast um, sort of late last year, and um, uh, that was a that was a one of the, the, the big scoring podcasts as well. Very popular. Popular. Um, but um, um, t- tell us about the work you've been doing with Alison. And I, I, I love the way that you phrase the um, the fact that you're interested in the human rights of workers, um, because we, we sort of I feel like we've been bashing the contractors. But actually, you know, there, 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 there are some groups out there doing some really good stuff, aren't there? Yeah, there are. Yeah, it's really important, I think, that we recognise that the way we do work has um, a cost on human beings and, and mm. the human workers. And there's no you know, despite some denying it, there is, there is, you know, strong evidence to show and strong, really um, hard evidence to show that the way we, we set up projects and deliver projects really has a human um, consequence. I mean, the construction sector has the second highest suicide rate as an industry. Every second day, a young con- uh, a construction worker takes their own life and a young construction worker is six times more likely to die, to take their own life than to die on a construction site. And that's all from the wonderful research from Mates in Construction. Mm. So we're currently um, studying the intervention of a five-day working week on the Concord Hospital site. Um, Mm. And we've been um, charged to do this work, this research, by New South Wales Health Infrastructure and Roberts Co. Um, We are um, analysing both the human cost in terms of we're surveying construction workers on that site and also um, Liverpool Hospital which had some enabling works, and that's a five-day work week as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're surveying workers around um, their well-being, um, their their enjoyment of work, what what hours they want to work, the Im- impact work has on them. Um, we're also undertaking interviews with workers and we are doing a cost-benefit analysis of that job. Additionally, um, this has never been done before, but we're actually seeing what impact construction work has on the next of kin, the partners of construction Mm. work. And that's been, I have to say, fascinating. I'm I'm a qualitative researcher. I'm not into the stats. But, um, you know, some of the, the initial findings have been that, you know, the impact that construction work has is not just on the people who are 
on the site, but it also is on the, the partners of the construction workers and their ability to, you know, secure um, economic safety, I guess, as women particularly, um, if they're heterosexual partners. So what we're hearing is that, you know, construction work because of the, you know, the, the expectation of long work hours, of, you know, geographical mobility, um, and the rigidness around that and the expectations a lot of that time around those long hours really impacts on um, the ability for the partners of construction workers to, you know, take on bigger positions, take on more hours. And the consequence of that, as one uh, participant articulated, is that their future economic security is undermined. So if she was to leave her husband, you know, she's left with less superannuation. She hasn't been able to develop her career. So I think the thing is that if the government, you know, when they're looking at, say, COVID responses, and it's, it's you know, I'm incredibly thankful that construction was an essential service, but the other response is because women have been, um, you know, greatly impacted by COVID more so than male workers to actually look at, you know, how we can structure, how we can restructure our sectors in construction because it does have these unintended consequences on the women, you know, mm. within our society and to really look at different um, delivery models. So the five-day work week, I mean, it's it's contained over five days. The site shuts down um, Saturday and Sunday. Mm. Um, and we will have um, the research findings. We have preliminary findings coming out in April and then we'll have final findings out in the second half of the year um, because mm. of effort analysis, for instance. Um, and this research hopefully will be form part of some of the research that's mentioned with um, ACA. Mm. Um, New South Wales and Victorian government have established a cultural a construction industry cultural task force, and I'm one of the mm. researchers on that. Um, it, that that research has been led by Helen Lingard, who has done you know incredible research in this sector, particularly around workers' health um, and safety, but also around gender. Um, and we will be we've, we're currently um, doing a literature review on um, the impact that work hours has on health and diversity. Um, and we're also then going to do a data scan of different types of um, project delivery models and what impact they have on. Mm. Uh, the health of workers, but also on diversity of, um, you know, the people who participate in our sector. And it's a real issue because, you know, we're a sector that, um, you know, increasingly is looking down the barrel of a skill shortage. Um, and, and yet we have this pipeline of work that we're delivering. So yeah. that research, you know, is also really fundamental in terms of moving the sector along. Yeah, no, fantastic. Um, you, you told me an anecdote which I which really sort of surprised me um, when we, we were talking before um, before before the podcast about um, when you first started doing your research and um, you were talking to a guy on site and um, he was talking about his own mental health. That really hit hit home to me. Yeah. So I, you know, I found it really interesting. Like I've been on construction sites for fifteen years and. Um, you know, apart from sort of dating advice, um, the guys never really shared much more of <laughs> of their personal life with me. Um, and my, on my first site, when I went to Shadow, so when I, our research was done, where I had a male researcher and myself, he he was an expert in um, masculinity, drinking, and um, young men. And so we we split up and we shadowed construction workers um, on these sites. And the first guy that I shadowed was a senior um, supervisor. Like you know, he was running a big site in the city, and uh, you know, he kind of looked exactly like you know the stereotype of a construction superintendent. You know, he mm. was you know, in his mid fifties, he kind of stood back, he watched what was going on from a distance. He knew everyone's name and, you know, he kind of, to me, appeared to have, you know, his shit together, if I may say that. Yeah. But on the way to um, Smoko, he, as we left the gates of the site and he started to tell me that, you know, every day, you know, he was having a panic attack on the way into work and that he had taken up the cigarettes that, um, he still, he drank most nights. He'd sit out in the shed. Um, he was incredibly thankful that he still was married. Um, and I, quite frankly, I was stunned because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been privy to these conversations when I was in my construction career. And what was really frightening is that every day 
when I, I mean, the majority of people we shadowed were men. We, we spoke a lot to men, you know, more so than women. And um, every day, bar probably, and every participant, bar probably three men, reported, you know, this level of stress, lack of sleep, either gaining or losing weight because they are unable to care for themselves or have the time to care for themselves. Mm. Substance abuse, marriage breakdowns. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I guess our key finding from and our key recommendation from the research was if you were going to increase the number of women, you actually have to change the working conditions of men mm. in the sector. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think this five-day work week model and then also looking at work hours is fundamental um, to shifting the way we do work in the construction sector. Mm. Um, we are really serious about the people that work for us and work and build our buildings. Yeah. I, I know that one question that comes up when people talk about this is what about trades? You know, they can work Monday to Friday, but they're probably going to be working Saturday as well anyway. So is that going to take any pressure off them but, or the subcontractors? They're going to get moved onto a job that isn't five days a week. It, yeah. Look, I think that there are trades like concreters, for instance, that move around and are much more mobile mm. rather than, say, plumbers and electricians and form workers that, are, you know, a stay on a job for a period of time. But I must say what's fascinating is when I'm doing these interviews and, you know, I, I get to listen to um, workers, these tradespeople, basically doing a cost-benefit analysis of their own life in terms of, you know, the cost of people say to me, oh, you know, they don't, workers don't want to lose out on that extra money um, yeah. time on a Saturday. But what I'm hearing is that they have calculated that in. They, they're they happy to do overtime and I think we'll find that there's a sweet spot in relation to overtime. Maybe 45 hours a week to 48 hours will be the sweet spot. I'm just guessing there. But what's fascinating is that they want their Saturdays off to be with their kids and that's overwhel- that surprised me because that overwhelmingly um, is has been what I've been told by workers when I've conducted interviews. And the travel to and from the site is huge, you know, is, is has a big impact on workers, mm-hmm. particularly those coming, for, say, in Sydney from the Central Coast. You know, if they're travelling a couple of hours, I mean, I spoke to a, an apprentice the other day and they got up at 4.30 in the morning to get to site at 6.30 to catch public transport. So, you know, they're, they're, the demands on workers in terms of travel to site is enormous and I think that from this study and even just the fact that the EBA agreement with um, Roberts, you know, has shifted to a five-day work week. I think workers are seeing the benefit of, you know, having this contained work week. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. But we could talk about this forever. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is when, when we set up the podcast, it was at a point in time when uh, COVID had just started, everybody was working from home. It was really quite stressful for a lot of people. And we were really worried about um, the younger people in the industry. So I was talking to jo- Joanne and Manning and David Harding from Arup and, um, and and that was the sort of the nucleus for the, for the, for the podcast. Um, I, I know that you're really interested in young people's careers as well. And I really like the, um, I think you put an article out recently on LinkedIn about the, 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 your, um, the sponsorship program that you're putting out rather than a mentoring program. And I'm really keen just to learn a little bit about about that as well. Yeah, look, I so Cultivate Sponsorship is um, the company that I've established and the program we've established, and it comes out of the research that I did when I was talking to a lot of um, senior men in the industry. They uh, described their career progression to me, and whilst they didn't articulate it specifically, what I heard was um, that they had been sponsored or formed strategic alliances with key other senior men Um, and these men basically picked them in their teams and either took them onto different sites or into different companies they gave them guidance on you know um, you need to be over this skill set you need to be on this critical path of you know and handle this trade they also you know shone a light on them to other um, people in you know key decision making roles so that they were promoted and thought about when it came to succession and and, um, progression and what was interesting is that when I interviewed senior women, they actually um, could articulate the times when they were sponsored mostly and probably in all cases by senior men. Mm. And it had a profound impact both on the, their legitimacy as construction workers but also on their career progression because someone was guiding them and telling them the informal rules around progression that, you know, you've got to make it in the first 10 to 15 years of your career um, to be considered, you know, talent and a real leader. Um, and different things, you know, you've got to, you've got to you know, undertake a number of these critical path trades and manage those, for instance. 
So as a result of that, we established um, a program that basically, you know, sponsorship happens um, organically out in in construction land. Mm. Um, So we have created this program, runs for seven months. It's where senior leaders are paired up with women in their business. And um, really the research finds that sponsorship is exceptional at retaining women as well as progressing them in the business because they're Mm. actually being seen for the first time. I mean, in our research you know, women, my research women, you know, said they were in the lost lands of their careers. You know, they just weren't being seen. So the program operates for seven months. It's a curated program. Um, it really it puts a focus on the leaders and building their leadership skills around um, gender equality, but also giving them time to think about their leadership legacy, what they want to be known for in the sector. Yeah. And then for the women, it really, you know, gives them, um, I guess, this this linkage to a, a senior male leader or a senior leader in the industry. It often, you know, raises them up to a global view of the business so that they are able to see the, the breadth of careers that are available in the sector. I think in construction, quite literally, we spend so much time in the trenches. We don't actually get to be elevated up to see what's going on within the business, the different career pathways that can be had. But it also, for the senior leaders, allows them to, um, or the women, to showcase their talents to these senior leaders and it gets them on the radar within their business. Mm-hmm. So we've been working um, with ACOM, who have been an incredible supporter of our business three years in a row. Um, Mm. Their senior leadership team has um, participated in um, Cultivate Sponsorship and also a number of um, construction companies. We're currently with John Holland, Langer Rourke and GHD. So we're we're very much active in the the construction sector. Um, And we have incredible feedback from the program and um, mm. it's, it's great to see research sort of be applied and put into action as well within the sector. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I can see how passionate about, about it you are. I love the smile on your face when you're talking about it. It was brilliant. Um, look, um, I think we could keep talking forever, but um, I, um, we, we, we're mindful of time and, um, and and our listeners' time as well. Um, but um, look, and, and Natalie, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and um, I think we're going to stay in touch and keep talking about these things and um, um, I'm super interested as things evolve and uh, maybe when the research comes out, we can, um, we can catch up again and, uh, okay. and talk further. Sure, for sure. No, brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much and um, thank you. Um, we'll talk again. Excellent. Thanks so much. Integrated Infrastructure is powered by North Search, specialists in executive and technical search across engineering, design, construction, property and energy markets in Australia. If you'd like to find out more about North Search or get involved with this podcast, you can click on the links in the show notes or email me directly at the address on the screen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Integrated Infrastructure. Please tell your friends and colleagues if you did, and we hope to see you again soon.